Watch this. A former high school student turned school board trustee turned activist college kid decided to, well, focus on his studies, which is why there was a contested race for his seat on the Boise School Board. Just one, but we sit down with the one who won. The Paralympic Games, they're wrapping up in Paris, and we've already told you about the athletes on Team Idaho, but how about a coach who calls Boise home or a power couple who met in Pocatello? Well, we didn't want the good news to stop across the pond, so we brought it back to Boise to find out some of your good news on this wonderful Wednesday. Well, the Boise School District will, will welcome a new board member next week, thanks to an election held last night. There are actually three races. Two of them, with four incumbent candidates, were uncontested, so they automatically got in. The other one, well, that one was contested. Two Boiseans, Krista Hasler and Matthew Shapiro, was the only race on the ballot that people were kind of voting for. They were competing for the two-term seat. Both ran unsuccessfully in 2022, so at least one would not see the same result this time, and it was Krista Hasler who pulled out the win by 265 votes over Shapiro. In an election that saw less than 3% of eligible voters participate, so while not exactly a full-throated stamp of approval, Aspen Shumpert asked Hasler about her win and her plans as a Boise School District trustee. My passion is with kids and teens, and they've just really driven my decisions in my life. Tuesday's election results named Krista Hasler the new addition to Boise School Board of Trustees, a social worker bringing a mental health perspective to the board. I think right now that's really relevant. It's something that the school district is really focused on. She says she looks forward to joining and adding to those efforts. Resources that will help with prevention for our students, that will help them know how to cope, how to deal, and then how to build character skills into their foundation that will help them be successful throughout the rest of their lives. She's coming in with a list of ideas from her own experience as a mother of four kids in the district, including literacy and reading performance and more AP class options for students. When you've got a diverse population, like we do in our district, you need more resources to meet those needs. And so I want to help try to bring those resources to our teachers and to our students. Hasler should be a familiar name for Boise voters. She previously ran for position on the board in 2022. Although the results didn't turn out in her favor two years ago, this time around she's prepped for the position. I've learned a lot about our district in the last two years. Um, I've taken opportunities to learn about our district and be involved and build relationships. And that's made a huge difference in where I'm at sitting today. She's originally from Rexburg, Idaho, but moved here with her family almost a decade ago, learning and growing with the community. And we love Boise. It is an incredible place and we love the people here. Love the diversity that we get to experience here in Boise and it's growing. There's still so much room for growth here in our area. And she's excited to be part of that growth. Hasler will be sworn in this Monday, September 9th, at the beginning of the school board meeting. And then, Brian, she's going to take her seat and start the responsibilities with the rest of the board members. Okay, it's interesting. She was also one that was endorsed by the Liberty Dogs, I that believe, is, but it's kind of pushed back on that. Yeah, I, I've seen that she's spoken and said, you know, I don't necessarily associate with them. And okay. so when that endorsement came out, she did make a statement about that. She distanced herself from that. Interesting, the, the number of voters turning out, 2020. I think there were uh, 7,000 people who voted mm -hmm. in this district race. Mm -hmm. In 2022, it was 20,000, or nearly 20,000. Yeah. Just 3,000 this time around. Yeah, so, so there was a decrease. Group. We saw Hasler's opponent speak out against that. You know, there was, I think it was just over 245 yeah. votes, so it was relatively close. And, and a small sample pool of voters. Right. All right, thank you very much, Aspen. All right, we have a quick follow-up to Dr. Ryan Cole's status with the Central District Health Board. Yesterday, we reported, thanks to our partners with the Idaho Press, his role as the lone physician on the CDH board was in jeopardy because his medical license was allowed, in Idaho, was allowed to lapse at the end of last month. Well, that status is now back to active, according to Idaho's Division of Occupational and Professional Licenses. That is active as of this afternoon. Dr. Cole told us today he learned of the lapse, which is a failure to renew within the allowed window of time. He learned of it this past weekend, called it a simple administrative oversight, just like everyone has missed a bill, an email, calendar item, birthday, etc. Dr. Cole told us today the reinstatement renewal was submitted as soon as he found out, and obviously it went through. He said he did not receive a notification, so he had no idea. 
And with it being an online electronic renewal process, Dr. Cole said since he sold his Garden City business, that'd be Cole Diagnostic, Diagnostics, he no longer has the staff to manage that process. You may remember Dr. Cole was appointed to the board back in 2021 in the middle of the pandemic, despite having a rather controversial take on how to handle COVID-19. A little more than two years later, this past January, the state of Washington restricted the medical license of the Idaho pathologist for knowingly sharing disinformation about COVID-19 and the vaccine, and also for prescribing ivermectin to patients as a treatment for COVID, which went against all medical evidence. For the next five years, Dr. Cole cannot practice as a primary care physician in Washington, but it looks like he will remain as the lone physician on the board of Idaho's largest health district. ACLU is claiming victory today in their lawsuit against Idaho's ban on gender affirming care for inmates. House Bill 668, it's a law which prevents public money paying for medical treatment for the state's incarcerated population. It's been put on pause by a federal judge and the ACLU lawsuit was given class action status. Two anonymous Idaho inmates first filed that lawsuit earlier this year, claiming it violated their Eighth Amendment rights, denying them necessary medical care for gender dysphoria while in custody. Medical treatments like hormone therapy, that kind of stuff. Well, today, that temporary restraining order issued last month, that was extended until the case is settled in court. The plaintiffs dropped their pseudonyms, and giving it class action status means the injunction applies to all inmates with gender dysphoria. They're exempt until there is a decision in what will now be known as Robinson versus Labrador. The Paralympics in Paris, they're full of inspirational stories, and we have two of them for you with Idaho ties, obviously. We can talk Paralympic sports, so we can talk about pretty much anything else. All you gotta do is send us a text message, 208-321-5614. You know the drill, include your name and the hashtag the 208. That way, we might be able to share yours at the end of the show. Americans are still in Paris panning for gold. The Paralympics continuing through this weekend. Final set of events coming up on Sunday. Americans brought home eight more medals in the paratriathlon, by the way. Did you know one of the coaches pushing the athletes calls the foothills of Boise home? And that's where he trains adaptive athletes from across Idaho. He tells our Joe Paris it's nice to escape wildfire smoke here in the gem state, but he does miss home, even though his current one is the picturesque parts of Paris. The grit, the passion, the competitive fighting spirit, all on display as athletes in the Paralympics wind down the summer of competition. Uh, the village is set up where it's just a wonderful, wonderful space for all these athletes uh, mixed in with other countries from all over the world. It, it really is. I wish everybody got an opportunity to see this utopia, you know. It's, uh, it's pretty fantastic. Boise's Mark Sortino is a coach for the American Paratriathlon team. His third Olympic Games is a coach. The team just brought home eight medals to add to the entire Olympic collection. He says the energy we've seen on TV matches reality in France. You can absolutely feel it in Paris from everybody around. Uh, certainly, it's as if the village never stopped. Uh, all the tens of thousands of volunteers. A perspective not really shown during competitions. 
life in the Olympic Village. Well, the Paralympics has about 4,400 athletes. The Olympics is a bit over 10,000, so we're a smaller. Uh, we also have a, a few less events, uh, so we're smaller games, but uh, we're staying in the exact same place. A place that has unique getaways for athletes, like the alcohol-free Corona Beach, because you can't drink on the job. It's non-alcoholic Corona, and <laughs> they have it set up like a beach, uh, and they have you know lounge chairs they have fake you know have sand in there and it's it's you know island music going and as you look around and see everything you could count 30 countries just hanging out because we're all, everybody wears their their country gear behind the scenes coaches also see the seminal moments that lead to an olympic stage we we see all the <laughs> we see behind the curtain and all the sacrifices and hard work and for me to see the athletes coming you know, full circle to to this week and and weeks uh, for all the Paralympics. That's the best part. I mean, that to me, uh, in in triathlon as a coach, once the race starts, there's no real coaching from me anymore. It's it's up to them. We may give them certain information on the course for splits, but it's really in their hands. So, for the coaching staff, it's it's really fantastic to be honest with you. It's it's a wonderful experience to be part of these athletes, elite athletes' uh, journey. Those elite athletes will soon be out of the village, and Mark says their living quarters have already been spoken for. Occupied by the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and then will be converted into livable spaces. So we have sort of temporary walls in our small areas of these, creating one apartment may have five little bedrooms. And then they'll come in and they already have people buying these these apartments and ready to move in once we're done. So it's it's a pretty cool system that they have. And that skyline of apartments that he was pointing out, that's where we were talking about. That's all part of the athlete's village. And Mark and I also spoke about the fact that athletes at the Paralympics, they're competing to be the very best in the world. But their message to the world in doing so, it doubles as encouragement for athletes just like them, but aren't on an Olympic stage. He tells me that all of this life with an injury or a diagnosis, he says he's found that adaptive athletes don't even know about situations like the Paralympics being something that these people can get involved in or something on a scale closer to home. They are elite athletes first, he says, and some of them just have a diagnosis. But Brian, I don't know if you've been able to watch too much of the Paralympics. It is unbelievable some of the things like goalball which is a, yeah. it's an exclusive sport to the Paralympics, watching them do this triathlon uh, through, I mean, the swimming, the biking, the running, these adaptive athletes are incredible. And then again, you, you just be honest with the situation. They're fighting an uphill battle, not being fully ably bodied. I know some of the archers have been getting a lot of attention just because they're able to do with their feet what many people struggle to do with all four of their limbs. Did you see the guy who did it with his big toe and he yeah. had the perfect accuracy? It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, all right, thank you very much, Joe. Okay, so yes, the Paralympics are going in Paris, which traditionally takes place two weeks after the traditional games. This year, we're reminded how connected those two events can be, kind of like a, I don't know, a crossover TV show. Think like when the Jetsons met the Flintstones or when Mad About You was connected to friends by way of Phoebe or any of the Chicago or NCIS shows over the years. This crossover was captured by one of the most viral moments of this Olympics. But we wouldn't be talking about it on the 2-8, of course, if there wasn't some sort of connection to Idaho. Remember Tara Davis Woodall and her Olympic gold medal winning long jump and how she saved one of her best jumps for after she realized she won that gold medal by leaping into the arms of her husband Hunter, a Paralympian who was cheering her on from the stands. Two -time NCAA champion. Those two happen to be very active on social media and they've been documenting their athletic lives together for quite some time. Look who they let on the track. I let myself on the track. Look at her. This is a story of how we met. Six years ago, they told the world how two high school track athletes from California and Utah can trace their origin story to Pocatello. So we both get to the track meet in Idaho. It's called the Simplot Games. It's amazing. It is amazing. And the crazy thing was, I wasn't going to go to this meet. Like, we had a dance that weekend at school, and I really am not an indoor track person, so I was like, you know what? I don't really need to be there. And then my buddies convinced me to go. I saw him warming up for the 400. I was warming up for hurdles. And I just, like, saw him, and I was like, who is that? At the time, I didn't know he didn't have legs. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing pants. Yeah, he's wearing some sweats. 
Tara says she made the first move and hugged Hunter after he won his race, and then a long-distance romance blossomed after they followed each other on Instagram, which is what a lot of other people do. Tara has 1.1 million followers. Hunter has 762,000 on Instagram. Their YouTube channel, called Tara and Hunter, has nearly 900,000 subscribers. Anyway, they married just two years ago and currently live in Arkansas. After she won gold in Paris, Tara promised big things from Hunter, a double amputee in the Paralympics. And in a way, he kind of delivered. While he didn't win the 100 meter on Monday, he did finish sixth, running a personal best and much better than his last place finish in the Tokyo Games three years ago. Hunter said he was proud of the way he competed in an event he's still not fully comfortable, and he's going to use it for motivation for the 400-meter final coming up. He still has that race and the 4 by 100 relay. That's also coming up on Friday. Simplot Games, where they met, this all started in Idaho in high school. The Simplot Games, one of the nation's top high school indoor track and field events, they're going to hold their 45th edition. That's coming up in February. You know, we're always looking for good news. How about you share some of yours today? Text us at 208-321-5614. You can send us your good news or ask us about anything we've talked about today. Just remember your name and the hashtag, the 208. Heading into the final stretch of summer, albeit one that has been choked by continuous fires and smoke, we thought we could offer some counter program to all that. And I know it's not Friday just yet, but it's not going to stop us from quenching your thirst for some good news. Hunter Funk set out downtown Boise to hear some of it from you. Okay, so tell me your good news. Tell us your good news. Uh, I asked uh, a girl yesterday and she said yes, so she's <gasps> my girlfriend now. Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, or how, or how do you feel right now? Amazing, yeah. I was at the Hosier concert, so like 10 out of 10. Talk me through the whole process. Uh, 
So I waited until a really good song and then I brought out a ring pop <laughs> and I asked her to be my girlfriend. It worked, it was amazing. Does it have you walking a little higher today too? I just feel good in general. <laughs> I love this, that was amazing, awesome. Thanks. Heck yeah. <laughs> What's your good news? Uh, my daughter's turning 21 tomorrow. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you nervous? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're excited? Yes. Happy birthday, Lexi. <laughs> well, my good news is what these are are bricks that were part of the trolley that was in downtown Boise. But you were able to snatch a piece and of then, history. And then this is a piece of Boise history. So I was just, uh, my good news today is I've got a friend that loves Boise history, and I'm gonna give this to him. That is so kind of you to think of him, too. So you guys have a good day. You too. Thank you. Tell us what your good news is. I'm moving to France in three weeks for 10 months. I'm au pairing, as in, it's like a live-in nanny. What motivated you to do it? <laughs> I graduated last year, and I didn't want to pay a lot of money for college. <laughs> I only took two years, but I'm taking French classes there as well. Um, bonjour, je m'appelle Leila. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Why are you traveling so much? I love it. Just because I like it. And I don't want to wait till I'm old to travel. I need to do it young. <laughs> Tell us what's your good news. And we just got a puppy. <laughs> what's your puppy's name? She doesn't have one yet. Any ideas? Maybe Sasha. <laughs> Why Sasha? It's the girl my son loves. <laughs> what do you look forward to most? Um, I don't know, taking her everywhere. <laughs> I love that. Step up, up to the mic. Tell us your good news. Uh, hi, I'm Heather. I just moved back to Boise after, oh my gosh, so many years. What brought you back to Boise? My parents. Yeah, they're so cute and old. <laughs> I just love doing what I'm doing and being in my city. How's it feel? Amazing. <laughs> it's my good news. <laughs> That's so okay, good. Bye. <laughs> and we heard from others who are getting married and excited about that, and others who are just thankful for a nice day. So that brings me to the big question there, Brian. Fairly nice day with the smoke. Yeah, right. smoke, smoke, yeah. you know, highs and lows. But okay. what's your good news? My good news. <sighs> Okay, I got one. Okay. My son, my youngest, just turned 16 today. Oh, well, happy birthday. There you go. So that's, Look. that's his good news because that kind of makes me a little bit old, doesn't it? Yeah, that kind of ages does. you a little All right. bit. That's, that's okay. as good as I can get. <laughs> Thanks, Hunter. <laughs> And I wish I had more good news in terms of the smoke, but I guess my good news is it's not expected to get a whole lot worse while it sticks around, so at least there's that. Um, we are expecting some of those higher smoke concentrations in southern parts of the state throughout the evening and overnight hours. So in parts of the morning tomorrow, places like McCall, Cascade, maybe you'll be able to open up your windows and let some of that cool, clear air in. However, as we go towards the evening hours, dinner time on Thursday, uh, while the southern parts of the state see improvement, looks like the smoke moves up in that direction. So it's going to be continuing to be short lived stents of improvement before we see these fires put out and then we can stop talking about the smoke altogether. So I've summed up that information here for you where we start off with more of the smoke in those southern parts, but then we get a little bit of improvement in the afternoon and evening hours. It'll be another hot day for us in the 90s in those valley areas. And the one spot that has been still in the good category for the air quality has been McCall and you can see how clear it looks there right now. So probably the spot to be other than maybe Ontario, they've had some good air quality today as well. Otherwise, though, lots of other areas are seeing the moderate or unhealthy for sensitive groups category. All the areas in gray have an air quality alert in place that will stay in place until at least Friday afternoon. And so just a reminder of what that means when we do have unhealthy air, limit your time out, limit your time outdoors and you want to avoid any strenuous activity like a long run or something like that. Temperatures will be staying hot. Clouds will increase this weekend and then it looks like we get a bit of a cool down as we go into to next week.
All right, welcome back. We got about a minute or so to wrap up today's Wednesday show of the 2A with your comments. We've got a couple regarding the Boise School Board election last night with the trustees being decided. Well, just one race, as a matter of fact, this one uh, saying they disappointed to hear about the low voter turnout yesterday. I didn't hear about the board election until last night. Maybe it could have been better advertised by the Boise School District. Another one saying Brian says turnout for local elections is so low. Why can't we implement mail in voting like we use for general elections? Well, we kind of mail in voting. Are you referring to absentee ballots? Because that was allowed for this election that was yesterday. You could have voted absentee if you are in the district and could have put your vote in by uh, yesterday's deadline if you wanted to vote absentee, which is technically a mail-in ballot, but you could also hand deliver it. So it does apply. It just, if you didn't hear about it, maybe that was the case that not many people knew it was happening. Looks like Liberty Dogs are, are celebrating Krista Hasler's win. You can see the tweet on X. Makes me wonder if she was being disingenuous about her involvement with them, says Sheila. I, I can't see it because, well, they blocked me several, several months ago, if not a couple years ago now, I'm trying to think. But yeah, Hasler has made comments when she ran last time about mask mandates in schools, but she did say that she was distancing herself and would not accept that endorsement should they endorse her again. So that apparently is, they may be celebrating, but she's not necessarily accepting that. Congratulations from them. Minor correction, the Simplot Games isn't just one of the top high school indoor track meets in the nation. It's one of the best in the world, says Jennifer in Boise. Athletes from Australia, Canada, even Africa come to compete in Pocatello, and it is incredible. That's amazing. I have to check it out. We'll see you tomorrow.